being an investor is not a matter of just being a greedy person. Very often, investors are not people that have wonderful images. We don't, there's no Nobel Prize for investing well. Why is that? Why didn't Alfred Nobel think that that was a noble profession? Well, he thought it probably wasn't as important as some of the things he gave the Nobel Prize for. But I think investing is important because it allocates capital in ways that can help society create jobs, preserve jobs, pay taxes, do other things like that. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary people from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Kevin Coldine, to host a series of in-depth conversations to help uncover and explain new ideas to make you a better investor. In the series, Kevin will be speaking to authors of new books and research papers to better understand the global economy and the dynamics that shape it so that we can all successfully navigate the challenges within it. And with that, please welcome Kevin Coldiron. All right. Uh, thank you, Niels, and welcome, everyone. Um, so a friend of mine who's a very experienced journalist said the key to a good interview is to sell your source make sure the listener knows the person uh, you're talking to has wisdom that they need. And uh, that should be pretty easy for me today because our guest today is uh, David Rubenstein. He is the uh, co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group, which manages $370 billion, making it one of the world's largest investment managers. Many of you will have seen him on Bloomberg TV, um, where he hosts uh, two separate shows, um, he's an exceptionally active philanthropist, one of the original signers of the Giving Pledge, which is a commitment um, among uh, billionaires to give away a majority of their wealth. Um, and he's here today to discuss with us his new book called How to Invest, which is a compilation of 23 interviews uh, David had with the most senior and successful investors across the full spectrum of the investment industry. Um, so not only is my source great today, but my source's source is uh, great uh, as well. So David Rubenstein, um, Happy New Year. Um, welcome to the show, and, and thanks so much for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so, you know, I've had some well-known guests on this show, but I think it's safe to say you're probably the most well-known so far. And, um, you know, I'll admit to being a little nervous before our talk. And it made me think that, you know, you've done hundreds of interviews um, in your life. And I was just wondering, who's the person that you were most nervous or anxious to to interview? And how did you, you know, how did you feel as you as you faced that down? Well, obviously, like anything in life, when you get more experienced, you are less nervous about it. At this point, i not that nervous about doing an interview probably with anybody uh, because I've done so many interviews at this point. But uh, when you have a large audience, um, I find that, uh, you know, it has to go well because you've got people watching you instantly. And if they either laugh or they applaud and you know whether you're doing well or not, if they boo, you know you're not doing well. I've interviewed uh, in front of a thousand people at a Carlisle event. I interviewed Barack Obama and um, it was interesting. In front of 2,000 people, I interviewed Jeff Bezos, and that went reasonably well. Um, at this point, I, I kind of have uh, a way of doing it, so I don't really get that nervous about it. I kind of think I know what I'm doing, just like you know what you're doing. Now, you are a professor, you teach, so when you go in front of your students, you're not nervous, I assume, because by this point, you've done it uh, more than a few years, I assume. So it's like anything in life. When you know what you're doing, uh, 
you know, you don't feel that nervous. Uh, maybe when I was starting out doing this, I might have been somewhat intimidated by some of the people I interviewed. But now at this point, I'm, I feel reasonably comfortable. Do you, do you think of it as a kind of a, a, a second career or more just an avocation, something you enjoy doing? Well, I came to it late in life, really. Um, so it's really an avocation. I don't make any money doing it. I don't charge anybody anything. I don't uh, seek to get any compensation for it or anything. Bloomberg doesn't really pay me. I basically, uh, they give me some, uh, char- they make a charitable contributions in my name uh, to some scholarship fund that I have. But, you know, I'm not really doing this for money. I just do it because I find it an interesting way to get to meet people. You know, you can always, uh, you know, meet people in different ways. But this is a way where I can talk to people from different w- walks of life. So I don't have to be an expert in baseball. I don't have to be an expert in science. I can just be an interviewer of people and learn a little bit about it through the interview and, be, and the preparation for it. So it's a way to get to learn a lot more uh, about different things in life. Secondly, it's a way to, um, I'd say, uh, break the ice with people. Uh, if you want to get to know them better, this is probably a reasonably good way to do it. Um, it's also keeps your mind reasonably sharp because you have to prepare. You have to uh, listen to what the person says. Oprah Winfrey said to me, she's not a great interviewer. She's a great listener. And it reminded me that when you do interviews, you have to listen to what the person says and pivot off of it. Um, you know, when you get to be older in life, I'm now 73, you always worry about whether your brain is going to be working as well as it should. And so you try to do various things to keep your brain active. Some people recommend crossword puzzles. Some people recommend taking a foreign language. Some people recommend learning a musical instrument. I would say I recommend doing interviews because you have to be sharp, listen to what they're doing, what they're saying, and also you have to prepare and read a lot to get ready. Yeah, that's it's interesting you say that because when you agreed to do the interview, I thought, okay, this is going to be this is going to be an easy book for me to kind of review and talk about, and it turned out to be just the opposite because you know in most most books I I interview the authors of there's a theme, there's a message, there's an idea they want to get across. And here it's, you know, I kind of had to, I had to do the work to pull the, to pull the themes from the various interviews. I mean, you do, you do summarize them, um, what you came across um, early in the book, but it, it was kind of challenging on that dimension. You know, before we get to that, I did pull out three themes that I want to talk to you about. But before we get to that, I, w- I just wanted to ask you a, a personal question. You, you, you trained as a lawyer, you practice law, and um, you said that you you weren't very good at it. You didn't didn't like it uh, largely because you you weren't very good at it. And I, I was curious why you think you weren't good at it, and what were some of the reasons that you maybe weren't as good at law? Um, did did those characteristics make you a better investor? Well, I'm probably not good in, at investing either. But let me describe. Um, I practiced law for two years at Paul Weiss, a very prestigious, well known law firm in New York. But I was really interested in government and politics, so I really saw it as a way station to getting into the government. And so I, I can't really say I was devoted to learning the, how to practice law because I really was focused on something else, which was going to Washington, working in the government, and ultimately working in the White House. When I left the White House after we lost the election to ni- in 1980 to Ronald Reagan, I went back and practiced law. It was the only profession I had. But I had missed four or five years of learning how to be a young lawyer when my classmates were learning that, I was in the White House having a good time, but I wasn't learning the skill set of being a lawyer. So when I went back into practicing law, I didn't have a specialty, and I didn't really want to specialize in one thing and say, this is what I'm going to do with my whole life, is specialize in this area or that area. So I tried to avoid that. And generally, I, I don't think I had an, uh, an, an interest in practicing law and doing what Washington lawyers do, which is somewhat uh, maybe like in, influence peddling. Some people might say not all Washington lawyers do that, but that's probably having worked in the White House, what people expected me to try to do. So I really didn't enjoy it. And I, my view is if you don't enjoy something, you'll never be great at it. So I've often th- said nobody's won a Nobel Prize hating what they do. You have to love what you do. So it's a passion in life. And so as an investor, I started at Carlisle in 1987, but I didn't have an MBA. Um, had I gone to the uh, JD, gotten a JD MBA, I would have been better off, but I didn't have that. So I hired people that had MBAs. They knew how to invest. And I made myself useful to the firm by being the fundraiser, the strategist, uh, maybe the recruiter of people and the face of the firm. But I, I really wasn't, I wouldn't say I was a great investor. I would say I 
been around a lot of great investors, but I probably wasn't a great investor. Do you, do you think that, and you're quite open about that in the book, and you're, you, you said it now, um, you didn't have a lot of investing experience. You started Carlisle, and your, your role at the firm um, was, you know, your, you know, strategy and public relations, the face of the firm, et cetera. Do you think because of that, that investment still holds a sort of mystique to you? Was that, was that one of the motivations for doing this uh, book? To well, kind of- I, I wanted to uh, write a book that would appeal to three different audiences. One is the students who are thinking about a career in business. And I wanted to kind of say, well, a career in investments, it can be very exciting. It's not uh, boring. It's very exciting, can be quite rewarding as well. So I wanted to kind of talk to that audience. I also wanted to talk to people who want and mid- midlife people, people who are not professional investors, but want to want to be investors. They want to take some of the money they've made and invest it, go in the stock market, real estate or whatever it might be. And I give them some of my views on how they might do that. But also I wanted to talk to people who are maybe midlife as well, but they recognize they're not going to be great investors. They don't think they're going to be great at picking stocks, but they want to pick people who are going to manage their money well and really pick man- money managers. And I kind of went into uh, how they might do that. So I, I was trying to appeal to different audiences, but give some of my experiences, my ups and downs, and you know, hopefully make it interesting. The trick to any book is trying to make it work well for the reader. You want people to read your book. Nobody wants to write a book that nobody reads. And so I try to make it appeal to the average person. You don't have to be a superstar investor to enjoy this book. And probably superstar investors don't need to read this book. Yeah, I, I, I like the, the way you described your intended audience at the beginning. And I, and I really felt that particularly for young people, students thinking about going into investment, you really hit the mark on two dimensions. One was, and I'd like to ask you about both if I could, um, one was I don't know, uh, mistakes. Like you, you start the book by saying, Hey, I've made, here's some, some bad decisions I've made. And then throughout the book, you know, the difficulties of these great investors come through. I mean, Ray Dalio at one stage says he was bankrupt, had to borrow 4,000 bucks from his dad just to, to pay, to pay the bills. Were you aware of those individual stories when you set out or did they, they come through? In other words, was this an intentional thing in writing the book is to say, Hey, even the great investors make mistakes or did that just sort of fall out of the interviews? Well, um, I had interviewed many of these people before and many of them are people I know reasonably well. So I'd heard some of these stories before and, but I really, for those I didn't know, I assumed that everybody made mistakes in life. And if you're an investor, you have to make mistakes. Nobody bats a thousand. Even Warren Buffett's made many mistakes. So I thought everybody would have some mistakes. And what I find is that, as a general rule of thumb, I value humility over arrogance. And one of the ways I think people can show their humility is by talking about their mistakes. And generally, the people I interviewed have a fair amount of humility to them, so I thought they'd be willing to talk about it. If if I find somebody that says, I've never made a mistake, I'm perfect, I, I just don't know how to say I did anything wrong, that's probably not somebody I would say is, is compatible with my own views in life. Uh, I think it's a good thing to admit mistakes and to learn from them. And what I was trying to say in the book to, to the reader is even the great investors have made mistakes, they admit it, and they go on to the next thing. I also said in the book that I still linger over my mistakes You know, 30 years later. I'm still saying, why did I do that wrong? Whereas a lot of these great investors, they go over it, get over it the next day, and they're on to the next thing. And that's probably an important trait, getting over your bad mistakes, learning from them, but getting over them and starting fresh. Do you think that's a a defining characteristic for someone who's thinking about going into investing? In other words, if you're someone who lingers over your mistakes, is that telling you, hey, maybe you know, being a professional investor isn't for you? Well, I think if you linger over your mistakes, you're just you know not get anything done because if you say, why did I do this wrong? Um, how did I do this so poorly? and you just spend all your time on a psychiatrist's couch saying how terrible you are, you're probably not going to be a great investor. You probably have to get over it and say, look, people make mistakes. I got this wrong. I do think it's very good to look back on what you did wrong and not to ignore what you might learn from that mistake that you made. And I think that's an important trait as well. But I, I do think people who are really smart people 
learn that they're going to make mistakes in life, particularly investors. What I was also trying to do in the book is to say that being an investor is not a matter of just being a greedy person. Very often, investors are not people that have wonderful images. We don't, there's no Nobel Prize for investing well. Why is that? Why didn't Alfred Nobel think that that was a noble profession? Well, he thought it probably wasn't as important as some of the things he gave the Nobel Prize for. But I think investing is important because it allocates capital in ways that can help society create jobs, preserve jobs, pay taxes, do other things like that. An example I give in the book is that there was a venture fund in Boston uh, that was a very good venture fund, but they put for 10 years, they put money into a small company in uh, Boston that didn't have any products. It never got anything approved by any government agency, yet they stayed with it. And those investors um, gave the money to, in effect, uh, create a vaccine, the vaccine that helped us with COVID-19. That company is Moderna. Moderna turned out to be a company where uh, I, I think we're all grateful that they were funded for 10 years without cre creating a product because you know, it did something useful for society. And so I try to say to people, if you are a good investor, you're allocating capital well, you are doing something useful for society. Yes, the people that work in government doing something useful for society, uh, professors are useful, but investors are useful too, because not only are they going to preserve bad companies and make them better, they're going to create new companies, and ultimately they're going to make a fair amount of money and give that money to philanthropic purposes, I believe. Yeah, that's a, a very important message, I think, for young people, because I've got four uh, you know, four kids, they're all sort of late teens, early 20s. And it's kind of shocking sometimes just to over listen to some of their conversations about, quote unquote, capitalism and how casually they'll talk about all the downsides of capitalism, which I think they've kind of, they've heard a lot more about, say, than when you and I grew up. So I think the giving the message that, um, you know, the capitalist system for what, for all its flaws is still the best system we have for producing wealth is, is an important one. Well, think about this. People are willing to say that capitalism is a good system, those people who are part of the capitalist system, but very few people are willing to say they're a capitalist. In other words, you, you don't find any members of Congress running up to their constituents and say, you know, I'm really a capitalist at heart, because they don't think that's a word that's going to endear them to their constituents. The word capitalism has taken on a, a, an aroma that's not so great. On, as you point out, it's created enormous amounts of wealth, create a lot of jobs for people, transform the world, but very few people are willing to say they're a capitalist. It's an interesting phenomenon how uh, words have these meanings now. For example, very few people in Washington, D.C., where I'm now, will use the word liberal. Nobody says they're a liberal. They say they're a progressive. Why is that? Well, progressive has taken on a better connotation. Uh, nobody in Washington says they like pork barrel uh, bridges or pork barrel roads. They say they want infrastructure. And these words take on meanings that um, are unfortunate in some cases. So the word capitalism has been, uh, I think, denigrated by people. And so I doubt that you could find very many people in Washington, D.C., members of Congress, for example, who say, yes, I'm an out and out uh, uh, red blooded a capitalist. They just don't get many people saying that. And so they have to beat around it and go around it and say, well, I like business or I like investments or I want to create jobs, but nobody says I'm a capitalist. It's unfortunate, but that's the reality. Um, I, I wanted to go uh, just loop back to, you know, the the target audience um, idea, and um, so the one one thing I think would would appeal to young people thinking about going to investing is the notion that hey, you know, Ray Dalio has made mistakes. Uh, John Gray bought Hilton at, you know. 2007 and it went down 70 percent he recovered so you can make mistakes and survive the other thing that i thought was quite interesting and i wanted to ask if that was intentional on your part is some of the people you interview come from backgrounds that really have you know that are not conventional that, that, that they didn't train in investing it's kind of the same, same way that you did and the thing that really stuck out to me was uh paul of uh, volant the cio of cio of rockefeller University, and she's you know was an art history major, and she's got this great quote where she talks about, hey, you know, in art conservation, you have to study and test in very careful detail before you do an invasive treatment on a piece of art because you need to know what could go wrong before you, you know, look at it. You have to understand 
all the details of the piece of art. And it and that has a direct parallel to investment due diligence. I, again, so my question for you was, it was and Michael Moritz also from Sequoia Capital is a journalist. There's a, there's a number of people who came at it investing from different backgrounds. Was that, again, an intentional thing that you tried to put forward or did that just, again, happen to fall out of the interviews? Well, I, I didn't go into the interviews thinking that that necessarily would be the outcome, but it turns out that very, very few people who are great investors today uh, intended to be that when they were young. And maybe you'd have to say to people, what what eight or nine or 10-year-old who says they want to be an investor is a normal person. So um, obviously there are a few people like that. Warren Buffett apparently was interested in business his whole life, but most people evolve and they get into businesses or uh, life occupations that they did not anticipate. So I don't know, when you were growing up, when let's say you're in high school, what did you want to be? Did you want to be a business school professor? Um, well, I wanted to, actually, I did want to be, own my own investment firm, which I did for, ended up doing for many years. Uh, so the professor is kind of a, a second gig for me. Yeah, I, I'm a little unusual in that. And that's pretty much what I wanted to, I, I mean, I did have illusions of being a, a baseball player, but they, they were, um, I was disabused of that um, pretty quickly in, in college. So then it was like, okay, I really want to work on Wall Street and ultimately be an investor. So I, I kind of knew from the beginning. Oh, you were young, I guess you were a good baseball player. I, I thought I was a great baseball player when I was seven. And then when I turned nine, I realized I really wasn't that good. So I learned earlier. But the most people, if you look at what they're doing now in their careers who are in their 50s or 60s, are not doing things that they thought they would do when they were in their high school. It just, you know, in my case, I thought I'd be in politics and government my whole life and maybe practice law a little bit. Now I, I've basically been in the investment business uh, most of my career now. And so it just, that's the way the life evolves. Um, and so it's, you know, I would say with the interviews I did, many people had these backgrounds that were quite different. As you point out, Paula Volent uh, was an art cons conservator. Um, Michael Moritz at Sequoia was a journalist. Um, Stan Druckenmiller, a great investor, uh, he actually wanted to be uh, a, a forest ranger at one point in his career. Um, so, you know, you just never know how life is going to turn out. It's very rare that somebody decides at the age of eight, nine, 10, or 11 to do something, and they actually do that the rest of their life. That, that rarely happens. If you were starting Carlisle now from the ground up, would you actively kind of hunt for these people with different backgrounds? Because, you know, the typical um, pipeline for into firms like yours um, and, and mine were, you know, good schools, good business schools. There's kind of a somewhat of a narrow pipeline. Do you guys actively try to get outside that? Well, when I hired people at the beginning, I was looking for people who were uh, compatible, could get along with other people, uh, because investing is a team sport, really, uh, in many ways, at least in private equity it is. And I was looking for people that um, had their egos in check, people that were willing to work hard, people that were reasonably intelligent but not geniuses. Hiring geniuses and managing them is very, very difficult, I've learned over the years. So you want people that are reasonably intelligent, not geniuses, pretty hardworking, but not obsessive compulsive to the point where nobody really wants to be around them. You want people that can share the, the credit and take the blame. Uh, you want people that have a sense of humor, uh, people that are willing to give back to society if they're successful. Those are the kind of things I'm looking for. I also look for in, in young people, people that actually can read and write. I find that very frequently people go to very good schools, they, they can't write very well. They can't write memos so clearly. And they don't tend to read unless they're forced to read a book or something. So I'm looking for people that have a love of reading, a love of writing. And also, I like people that actually can communicate orally. So I tell people to practice your oral communication skills because how do you get anybody to do what you want? You have to convince them. You convince them by writing or by talking. And I think those are skills that often people don't get in business schools or other kind of graduate schools. And let me give you another example of a skill that I, I doubt that you have at your business school, but maybe you do. I don't think they have this course at Harvard Business School or Stanford Business School, the schools I'm, and New York Chicago Business Schools. Those are the three business schools I know the best. Most people in their adult professional life in the business world and in the philanthropic world will wind up asking people for money. They will say, can you invest in this or, or can you make a charitable contribution? But there are no courses in fundraising. The art of how to ask people for money is one that's lost. When the PhD was first developed by the University of Bologna, I think in 1060 or so, you, they were said that then to get a PhD, you have to have two foreign languages. 
Well, I think they should have said you should learn how to take a fundraising course or learn how to fundraise. If you're in the academic world, you know many academics spend half their time looking for government grants or other kinds of grants. And so I wish that business schools would teach people how to ask people for money and and, and treat fundraising as a more significant uh, exercise than maybe they do. So that's just a tangent. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's fascinating. Um, I mean, that's something that I did for you know twenty years, and but I had no training in just sort of grad and was quite uncomfortable doing it at the beginning, and then you just just sort of learned uh, learned on the job. If we go back to you know the themes I was trying to pull out of the books, so I sort of looked through the interviews and thought, okay, are there themes that that pop out consistently? And there, there were three that I, that I thought, uh, two of which I think there's kind of a tension, and one, it's more of a curiosity in my point, but the, the first one was this notion of diversification versus concentration. So, you know, in the beginning of the book, you say, you know, one of the things you would recommend to most people is to diversify. Ray Dalio said that's a, a lesson that he learned. Of course, that's what we teach in business school. At the same time, you know, Stan Druckenmiller is saying, Almost all great investors are great concentrators. Warren Buffett is known for making big bets. John Gray from Black, uh, Blackstone said that the best thing is to be a high conviction investor. So, you know, we've got this tension between, you know, spread out your risk uh, on the one hand or, you know, put it all into a small number of bets on the other. How do you think about that? How do you reconcile those two views? Well, as a general rule in thumb, a rule of thumb, the people that make great fortunes have are people that take a bet and just put their foot on the accelerator and just go ahead and that's it. Bill Gates started one company. Steve Jobs started another company. That was their life. Um, in the investing world, uh, George Soros famously said, you know, when you have a great idea, double down, triple down. That's what he did. Uh, but most people in life don't do that. Most people hedge their bets. They a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, don't take too big a risk. The people that take the big risks often fail, but often they succeed as well. So I guess in my own case, um, I'm probably more cautious. And so I don't put all my eggs in one basket. Um, had I done so, maybe I, my life would be different. But um, I think if you admire the great entrepreneurs and the great investors have really made big, big bets and they often worked out. The ones that didn't, you don't hear about them because they're not great investors. But even the investment professionals, even if they make a big bet, they don't usually bet so much money that they, if they fail, they're out of business. You know, I, maybe if I push back a little bit on that, because I mean, you've you've made a a, a great fortune in you know in almost any objective way, and so I'm assuming that you had a very very concentrated bet just on the on your business that you founded. Well, it was a concentrated bet in that sense, yes. Um, what I did is I decided to go in private equity and basically tunnel vision myself for 20 years. I didn't do any nonprofits, no philanthropy, no outside boards, nothing for 20 years. And basically what I did is I came up with a business model that more or less is what the large private equity firms have pursued, which is to say have multiple disciplines, not just buyouts, but have growth capital, venture capital, real estate, debt, and so forth, and then globalize it and have have all these kind of entities in different disciplines, but also have it all over the world. And that was a, a concept that I basically put my foot on the accelerator on and spent 20 years recruiting people, raising the money for that. So I did take a bet. Now, suppose private equity had scandals all over the place and people didn't want to go into private equity uh, five years ago, 10 years ago. I would have wasted you know, 20 plus years building this model and if people didn't want to go for, for give us money, then it probably would have been a wasted bet. But I did in fact, double and triple down on the model that I had in private equity. And that was my my career uh, that when I when it became clear that it was going to be successful and I could ease up a bit, I then got more involved in philanthropy and all the nonprofit things I'm now involved with. But but along the way, presumably your your most of your net worth was in in Carlisle and you didn't actively try to diversify it. You're like, hey, I've got I've got a good thing. I believe in it. High conviction. And I'm going to stick with that. That's correct. I mean, I have the advantage that I was on the investment committees. I'm hiring the people that are doing the deals. And so I kind of knew what was going on. But, you know, economic circumstances could go against us. We had the Great Recession. We made a lot of mistakes in that area. So, yeah, I, you know, I can say I got lucky in many ways. And I, I'd certainly be the first to say I got lucky. Uh, when I was in high school, nobody thought I'd be a great investor. And in college, nobody thought I'd be a great anything. 
I doubt if anybody in my college class even knew I was in the class probably. Um, I became the chairman of the board of my alma mater and now the chairman of the board of my university where I went to law school. I doubt anybody in either my law school class or my college class if they could, they could even remember my name because I wasn't all, all that great, but I got lucky. Well, I mean, I think that that that's a that's probably an important aspect of being a good investor, and, and that that comes through a lot in your interviews is admitting that luck plays a role, and acknowledging you know that the combination of luck and and skill. The other theme that I kind of saw in the book, and it's one that I've been interested in a in for a long time, is the notion of size in investment. So, I think you can make an argument that. In investing size is the enemy of returns. You get bigger, you're managing more money. That limits the type of deals you can do. It, you have more market impact when you do do a trade. Um, on the other hand, investment firms obviously have an economic incentive to grow. They get more fees. Um, they get more market power. Um, you know, Don Fitzpatrick, who was the who's the CEO of Soros Fund Manager um, Fund Management. Um, you interviewed you know, her in the book, and she said that you know, taking in assets past a certain point erodes the quality of returns. Um, on the other hand, you have Sandra Horbach from your own firm saying that, you know, in her view, bigger buyout firms are going to continue to take market share. So you have this, you know, on the one hand, acknowledgement that managing more money makes it more difficult. On the other hand, there's a, you know, more money is flowing to the big managers. So again, that that seemed to me something that was you know, I don't know, a, a kind of a tension that ran through some of those interviews. And I was curious to hear how you think about that issue. Um, the way the business world, and you would know this from being a professor in, in uh, a business school, uh, measures success is growth. If I said to you, my company has the same earnings every year, we don't want to grow anymore, we just want to have the same earnings, you'd say you're not going to get anywhere, you're not going to recruit people, you're not going to be a big success. We measure everything by growth. Now, when you're, when you're managing a large sum of money, the larger the money, money you manage, the harder it is to get a high internal rate of return just by the law of size. On the other hand, if you're managing staggering sums of money, you don't need to get 30% uh, internal rates of return. You could make, get 10% or 12%, and given the amount of money you're managing, that's spectacular. So in terms of the quantitative dollar amount. So it depends. Some people uh, like to have large sums behind them, and that gives them the flexibility to do bigger deals and get all the kind of a, a, a rewards from doing bigger deals. But some people just worry about their internal rates of return, and they want to do that uh, well by having a smaller amount of money under management. So each to his own. I don't say there's one that's better than the other. In our case, we, we have managed now close to $400 billion. It's obviously hard to get a 30% rate of return on $400 billion every year. But, you know, we, we do reasonably well, and, and other private equity firms of our size have been able to hold on to their investor base quite well. I mean, it does make it tricky for investors who are, say, looking at the history of your firm or other firms where, you know, you've generated high rates of return over time. But in some sense, those were, those were different firms. And Carlisle was small, was managing small amounts of money. So how do you, how would you advise investors to kind of evaluate a firm like yours or another one of the very successful firms that you interviewed that have, that have changed kind of structurally over time? Well, there's no doubt that firms change and so forth. So I tell people in the book that if you're looking at investing with Carlisle, Blackstone, KKR, or any fund, these are the things you need to look at. Look at the internal rate of return from recent years. See what that rate of return, uh, who achieved that. Are those people still there? Are, is the area that they made that rate of return in still relevant? Um, is a firm one that, that has a reputation for integrity, people... Uh, don't sue them all the time for, for you know, malfeasance or things like that. Is it a place where the younger people are happy to stay? Is They're the ones who are going to do the bulk of the work. Is it a place where um, they're doing things that you're comfortable with ethically in terms of investing in certain areas that might be un inappropriate to you? Um, also, make sure you understand what they're doing, what the fees are. Um, there's a lot of due diligence you have to do in picking a manager. But I think right now, when you look at Blackstone, Carlisle, KKR, Apollo, these very large firms, what they're selling to their investors largely is we've been around for a long time. We have a lot of stability. We don't make big mistakes. We might make mistakes, but we, we know how to fix them if we do make mistakes. And you're going to get a reasonable rate of return. There was an old saying in, in years ago, it turned out not to be maybe right, 
uh, you don't get fired for buying IBM because IBM at the time was the, the best computer company. Well, now you're not likely to get fired if you're an investment committee and you went into a Blackstone fund and it didn't do that well. Because you would say, well, look, they're the best you know, real estate investor in the world and I went into a real estate fund it didn't do well. You're not likely to get fired for that because you made a reasonable bet. There's no doubt that some of the good firms and some good companies come and go. Think about this. The universities don't come and go so much. If you take a look at the best universities in the United States in 1900 or 1930, they're roughly the same as they are today. If you take a look at the best companies in the United States in 1900 or 1930, there are no companies in 1900 or 1930 that are best today. None. So the world changes in business much more rapidly than it does in the university world, for sure. So that would, in some sense, argue for, I guess, maybe being a little bit cautious about going into some of these more established firms, right? That given that the dynamism of capitalism and, and the competitive advantage of, of new entrants might, you know, might erode some of that. Well, there, there's no doubt that you should be cautious, but think about this. It depends on your point of view. Let's, let's suppose you're an individual investor. And let's suppose you've got $10 million to invest and you want to invest in buyouts. Well, um, you're probably going to be better to go to a smaller fund that's specializing in one narrow area and where your money can get deployed more rapidly. If you go into a $30 billion buyout fund with $10 million, your money is going to get called down over many, many, many years. And by the time it gets called down, you know, the, the world may have changed a bit. But if you're a sovereign wealth fund and you need to put out into each buyout fund you go into a billion dollars, you can't go to the small fund because you overwhelm it. So your choices are more limited to going to the bigger fund. So it depends on how much money you have to invest. And also, you know, what is your need? Is your need for rates of return that are well above the market averages or just getting market averages? Is that okay? Now, that's I, I, that's a really nice way to put it because in some sense what you're saying is that the institutionalization of the investment management world reflects the – kind of concentration or institutionalization of the asset owner world, right? The sovereign wealth funds have grown up in the last 30 years and they have huge amounts of capital to deploy. They didn't 20, 30 years ago. And so they need, you know, they need asset management firms who can, who can handle that, that sort of volume. I think that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, ph philanthropy is something that you've mentioned a couple times in, in just in our conversation. It's a theme that, you know, that, that runs throughout the book. Um, you know, you're a signer of the of the Giving Pledge, as are, I think, at least four other people in, in the book. I, I really appreciated how at the beginning of the book, you know, you framed the motivation for philanthropy. And you said, hey, look, part of it is just, you know, people get some social approval for, for being philanthropists. That's not the entire motivation, but you, you know, you acknowledge that that's part of it. And I think that that's absolutely right. Um, I, I'm curious to hear from you, your kind of a, a kind of a broader view on how much we as a society ought to be relying on philanthropy for a, you know, a redistribution of wealth or do, do we need a redistribution of wealth or how active the government should be in trying to to do that? Well, as you know, um, there is criticism of philanthropists these days because people are saying, well, why should Bill Gates decide what is an important priority for our society? And uh, some people may say, why should David Rubenstein decide why it's important? Who elected him or who elected Bill Gates? Um, that's a fair point, but you have to put it in context. Uh, the U.S. government, for example, has a budget this year probably – close to $7 trillion, $7 trillion. The amount of philanthropy given in the United States this year will probably be around $450 billion or so. So under $1 trillion, uh, under a half a billion. So it's not as if, you know, the, the people giving away philanthropy, and I should point out that 40% of that $450 to $500 billion is given to religious institutions, which are, you know, a little bit different, but we count it as philanthropy. But if you were to take the kind of things that are trying to change things non-religious wise, you're talking about probably 1% of GDP, 2% of GDP, very small percentage. So it's hard to believe that the 1% or 2% of GDP going into philanthropy is really going to change society all that much. It's kind of what I call a, a kickstart. You know, if you, um, let's suppose you realize that we have a problem with, let's say, illiteracy in our country, which we do. Um, maybe a foundation can create 
some more incentives for people to want to focus on that. And the government doesn't really quite do it that well. But it's not like any big problem can be truly solved by philanthropists uh, because the government has so much more money to devote to things. And the government in the end is really going to be the uh, the 800 pound gorilla in solving any social problem or or not solving it. But but they have so much more money. So I, I understand the argument, but I, I don't think it's completely fair. Uh, and I do think it's a good idea to let people decide what to do with their own money. So in my case, for example, if I was taxed at 90 percent, uh, and as you know, the marginal tax rate in the 1960s in the United States was 90 percent. Now, nobody paid it, but it was theoretically 90 percent. So if, if let's suppose everybody was paying 90 percent and therefore the government's getting you know, basically 90 percent of all the, the wealth created in the United States, would our country be better off? I don't know. Uh, do you think that uh, we're now witnessing what's going on in Congress and they can't even select a leader in the House of Representatives? Is it a good idea to say to our government, you take 90 percent of the money and you'd figure out what to do with it because you're so much smarter and better organized? Probably not. So I think having some smart people who have made some money and are pretty intelligent trying to address in a modest way some social problems is not such a bad thing. But I realize that is not the zeitgeist of the era. The zeitgeist of the era is more to criticize philanthropists for picking their social priorities over those of the government. Yeah, and I, I, I maybe I should have been more clear with my question. That that wasn't what I was getting at in the sense of criticizing, um, you know, Bill Gates directing money to a particular cause. It was more that if one recognizes that we need, say, a, a circulation of wealth to basically help recirculate power because wealth and power are, are very closely connected. Um, although you, they, they might probably shouldn't be in a democracy, but they are. I guess my question was more, should we rely purely on the philanthropy of individuals in terms of giving back their wealth and um or should there be you know should there be a, like a wealth tax not an not 90 percent income tax but more that hey you know above a certain level of wealth we're going to you know we're going to start recirculating that back to society over the years societies and governments that have tried wealth taxes have found they're very hard to administer and you tend to force people to leave the country me a ta- country where where there is uh, a great uh, wealth tax, a significant wealth tax, where people are of high income are staying in that country, I, I, I or creating great entrepreneurial new ventures. You know, I don't really know where that would be. So I, I do think that um, you can argue that our tax rates are too low in some cases. You can argue that the system is poorly administered. But I, I think when you get into the wealth tax area. Uh, it's very hard to figure out how do you tax wealth. For example, you have illiquid real estate. Uh, what do you do? If you own prairie land, hundreds of thousands of acres of prairie land, how, how do you really tax that? There's no cash there. So I, it's very complicated. Uh, I wouldn't say we have the best system in the world, but I would s- prefer the current system over some wealth taxation system, which I think is very difficult to administer and easy to cheat your way out of. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the inequality, uh, the distribution of wealth is an issue? Is that is that one of the things that's causing capitalism maybe not to get as good a name as it had say, when you and I were growing up? Well, there, the, look, the inequality of wealth in the United States is increasing, and it should be an issue, and it is an issue. But it, it's not clear to me that you would solve that problem by taxing people more. For example, we have a problem in this country where you know, 30% or so of function of adults are functionally illiterate. If you take all the money that the four, the people who signed the giving pledge have committed to wealth or just take all their money away, would that money get distributed in a way that's going to solve the illiteracy problem? I don't know. I, I suspect not. So I just not sure that you can easily solve these problems by just taxing people more. You need to make sure that the programs that you, you already have work better. But I realize that given my position, people will say, well, I'm a wealthy person, so why would I want to be taxed more? I, I do pay, unlike uh, some well-known public figures, I do pay uh, you know, staggering amounts of money, nine-figure um, amounts of the federal government uh, in income tax a year. And so I, I, I feel I'm paying my, more than my fair share. Yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, I've i lived in California for a long time, so I, I understand what it's like to have tax rates well above 50%. I, I, I think that's to me, you know, I, I don't. I think taking more than half of someone's income just does, 
doesn't make a, a lot of sense, but I, I do wonder if we need a more active way to recirculate wealth, mainly because just wealth and power are so closely tied together in our society. But what, what, let's put a, a, a pin in that. I, I, I want to, you, you mentioned something actually in our, in your response to the charitable question that charitable donations are kind of like a Kickstarter for, you know, issues that, that, you know, need broader societal attention. They can't solve it, but they can bring attention to it. And that reminded me of a quote that Larry Fink had in your interview. And he said, hey, when finance recognizes a problem, it brings it forward. In other words, when, fi- when the markets say, hey, ESG is an issue, it, it doesn't solve the problem, but it brings it into our consciousness. And I feel, I, I just thought that was a an, an really, really clear way of expressing what's happened with ESG in that, you know, it was something that was kind of out there, but that what nothing was really happening. And then when firms like BlackRock uh, started making it central to their business model, it, it really did force it to be, come to the attention of the broader society. Um, but then there was this this really kind of ferocious backlash that we've seen in the last 12 months. And it kind of, it almost sort of happened... I think after your interviews and after you published your book, um, and so my question is: Were you surprised by how, by the scale and nature of the backlash against BlackRock and, and ESG in general? I, I was surprised, as you probably know. I think the state of Florida said they weren't going to give any more money to BlackRock to manage things like that. I, I would say that Larry Fink has done a really good job of, of developing the concept that ESG is important to money management. There's always their action. Whenever you have an action, there's a reaction. It's like the law of physics. There's always a reaction. And I think this reaction came about in part because a concern about political correctness, but also the war in Ukraine uh, emphasized how important it is to have oil and gas to people to heat their homes and so forth during winter. And people were saying, well, we're more focused on climate change than we are about heating people's homes in a time of crisis like the Ukraine war. But I don't think the ESG movement's gone away. It, It, you know, Nothing uh, goes forward in a straight line all the way to the sun. You have oscillations, and there's an oscillation here. Maybe it's a down period, but ESG is here to stay, and it's not going away. Maybe it'll be going somewhat slower than it would have otherwise been, but I, I don't think it's it's going away. When when you're on, I, I don't know if you're currently on any investment committees for for the you know various charitable institutions that you support. So how do you th- how do you think about that then in terms of you know, um, investing in, say, I mean, I could probably make the case that investing in, I don't know, natural gas pipelines and infrastructure is actually good for the environment in the sense that it makes, you know, the energy transition, you know, faster. I uh, am on a number of investment committees, and I chair a number of them as well in the nonprofit area. Um, if it's a government-oriented agency, for example, like the National Gallery of Art, I chair its investment committee. There, we are very sensitive uh, to uh, diversity, DEI, ESG, and we we have metrics and we've uh, put into place ways that we would measure how we're doing in that area. Um, some nonprofits I'm involved with are less focused on it. Uh, they're not completely ignoring it, but they're just less focused on it because they're more focused on rate of return, and they often have a view that rate of return will be be higher if you don't focus on those things. I don't agree with that, but that's a more conventional point of view. Um, so, yeah, I would say people are focused on it, and the nonprofit world tends to be more focused on ESG than I would say the for-profit world at this moment. So you, you believe that, um, you believe basically BlackRock's core, I guess, uh, motto in this in this sense, which is that ESG is not a kind of a social uh, preference, but it's something that is ultimately going to mean higher returns. Look, look at it this way. Young people want to buy products and services from companies that are good on the environment. If you are terrible on the environment, you may have fewer customers, fewer suppliers, fewer people want to work with you. If you are seen as a really great environmentally friendly company, you may get younger employees who are more talented. You may get more customers, you may get more employees, you may get you know a whole variety of other benefits. So the conventional view is that that if you worry about ESG, you'll get by definition a lower rate of return because you're foreclosing certain investment options. But I think there's an increasingly good view 
that more and more people want these things to be part of the products and services they buy. And so they will buy things more readily from people that are good on ESG and so forth. Now, how do you measure whether somebody's good on ESG? Uh, we have PE ratios. We have sharp ratios. We don't have an ESG ratio that is in the stock table that says to everybody, um, IBM's ESG ratio is X. Once we get that, which we'll probably have in five years or so, everybody will have an agreed upon number on their ESG uh, ratios, let's say, and therefore people can be judging more accurately how good some of these firms are in that. Yeah, I I think that's that's right, and that's a I guess an, as another example of finance bringing things forward, right? That uh, you know I, I think your interview with David Blood of uh, Generation Investment Management talked about that as well, where there's you know the IFRS is is working on kind of new ESG standards that that ultimately hopefully will be part of kind of just standard international financial reporting, uh, giving investors more transparency there. I, I think part of the issue, but my, just my personal opinion, is that. The origins of ESG, because I was involved in some of the early stuff, was was really just kind of tossing stuff out, right? Saying, "Hey, this is, you know, we get rid of gun manufacturers or get rid of this or that," and it was, um, you know, it wasn't nearly as thoughtful as as I think it is it is now. Well, look, um, in the early days of uh, investing, or not to the early days, but I'd say in the nineteen sixties and seventies, Milton Friedman uh, had a view that. Uh, a CEO's obligation, a board's obligation was only to worry about shareholders. That's changed. Is that a mistake? You know, now we worry about shareholders or what we call stakeholders. We worry about employees. We worry about communities. We worry about other things. It's probably better for capitalism to, to have done that. But remember, if you did that 40 years ago, people would say you were, you know, practically a communist. We're, we're coming up here on on uh, a time limit and um, so maybe I just if I could ask you a couple maybe more personal questions to, to wrap up we talked right at the beginning about books I mean this is a this is a show interviewing authors and and um, reading is something that that came through in almost every interview right just insatiable appetite among these investors to learn more to read how do you decide what to read Um You've got a. You presumably your time is pretty limited. Um, how do you, how do you figure out what you're going to read? Well, I have a number of programs where I'm going to interview authors, so I feel it's a you know it's uh, a courtesy to read the book of the author you're interviewing, and and so I try hard to do that. And while I'm involved in selecting the authors, not all the time, and so um, so I, I tend to uh, read books in areas I know something about, so I can read them more readily and quickly. So I know a fair bit about biographies history, business, uh, philanthropy, politics, and I tend to read a lot of those kind of books. Um, if you gave me a book on science or a book on, uh, you know, some kind of technology or astronomy, I probably wouldn't get through it so, so readily. So I, my trick is to kind of read books that I know reasonably well. I don't read fiction. Um, my fiction outsells nonfiction generally, and obviously people love it, but I'm, I, I generally like to read nonfiction. And so that, you know, helps focus me a bit. But uh, generally, I'm interested in a limited number of subjects, I guess. And so I tend to read books in that area. So with this show, will you be the one proposing the books? Or will someone say, hey, um, take a look at this? What do you think? Or will you be saying, no, I, I want to do this particular book? You mean for um, for the interviews programs I do? or Yeah, I, th I thought you just said you were, you've got, you know, you were. Okay, so, uh, well, I have a number of programs at the New York Historical Society. I interview historians at the, in front of the Library of Congress, at, for, in front of members of Congress, I interview historians. And, they, and the people organizing the programs will ask me about the books, and I generally will probably go along with their recommendation. But then I have to read the book. And, uh, and I, sometimes books sound better than they actually turn out to be. And sometimes they're surprises, and books are much better than you thought they'd be. I'm reading one book now that I can barely keep my eyes awake, uh, open because this is boring as can be. But I would never tell the author that. But uh, and there's sometimes their books are so good you can't put them down. Yeah, I, I uh, it's a struggle for me because I, I I'm a slow reader. But we we had uh, Chris Miller on the show who wrote Chip War about um, you know kind of the semiconductor industry and that just was I mean that won the FT Business Book of the Year and I I, um, I blitzed through that in in a weekend which is a, a record yeah, right here. <laughs> there you go. You're holding up Chip War. Yeah, that's um, have you read it? 
I have not, but I am going to be. I just got it uh, delivered today, and I'm going to be reading it. I don't know if I'll interview him, but maybe I will. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's an excellent one. Um, so l- l- last question for you. Um, you were born in Baltimore, um, grew up in Baltimore, and you paid, played baseball at least to the age of nine. Um, presumably you were an Orioles fan growing up, but then the Nationals came to town. That's the Washington, D.C. team for uh, our non-U.S. listeners. So my question is, did you switch loyalties or have you stuck with the uh, the Orioles. Well, I'm still I'm loyal to my hometown, as most people are, but I still like the Nationals, and uh, you know we'll see what happens uh, with both of them. They're both teams are probably at some point going to be sold, but we'll find out. Okay, H- hedging your bets, diversifying. Um, well, listen, I um, I know you're exceptionally busy, and um, I really appreciate the time you took to to speak with us and the time you took to write the book. All right, well, thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Thanks, David. Thank you so much, David and Kevin, for a much more wide-ranging conversation than I had expected, and that I think our audience will also appreciate the depth and the width of the topics that you covered. It was, of course, fun to hear about David's own experience as an interviewer and what he had learned from Oprah, but also the benefits that he sees from doing all the interviews that he does. I loved his observation that nobody had won a Nobel Prize for being a good investor, but that this really is something that should not be undervalued by society. The discussion about capitalism was fascinating, so I enjoyed that as well, and learning about what David is looking for when he hires people for his business and the skills that are not taught today at universities, but that are really important in real life. And finally, the topic of ESG is fascinating to me because It has such deep implications about how society is moving forward, so I found this section quite interesting as well. Make sure you go and follow David and Kevin's work, as well as getting a copy of their books, because as you can tell from today's conversation, some of these ideas and topics are not being discussed enough on mainstream media. From Kevin and me, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.